Hey everyone, so for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the origins of the Cold War. The Cold War was a conflict that, in its nature, never actually led to direct war between the Soviet Union and the United States, but it was a conflict which lasted for almost 50 years, and it really split the world in two between communist Soviet Union and democratic United States. So in 1945, World War II ends. The most devastating conflict in human history has come to an end. Over 60 million people have died in World War II, and people and nations are exhausted after fighting, after the amount of conflict, the amount of death, the amount of destruction. Um, you, you would think that it'd be time to play nice. Everyone would take a deep breath and be like, okay, let's reset. However, that's not what happened. Um, in a lot of ways, the end of World War II almost led directly to World War III. So the Cold War begins as soon as World War II ends. The United States and the Soviet Union, the USSR, cannot get along. Remember, they were allies in their defeat of Nazi Germany. Um, they had worked together to defeat fascism, but immediately after the war, they could just not get along. Um, and this conflict, the Cold War, lasted until the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. So let's take a minute and look at why this happens, um, why these two powers could not get along. And the reason because of this is because of conflicting values. Each state, each government had contrasting beliefs and ideals that guaranteed conflict. So we've talked a lot in this class about the American ideal, the American dream. What are the American values? The idea of freedom and opportunity are a guide to the United States. The big political ideal in the United States is the idea of democracy. And the underlying philosophy behind all of this is that everyone is equal. While the United States has not often lived up to this promise, that is the promise of democracy. Um, and the government should represent and protect the people. So this is a government that is granted its powers by the people. The consent of the governed, as Jefferson says in the Declaration of Independence, the idea of a democracy that is representative of the people. One of the big ideas in America, and one of the ideals of the American lifestyle is the idea of freedom of religion. People have freedom here to practice whatever religion they want. So you have people like Mindy Kaling, who's a Hindu. You have people like Ice Cube, who practices Islam. You have people like Larry David, who practices Judaism. Or someone like Tom Cruise, who is a practicing Scientologist. Um, and while a lot of people in the United States are Christian, a lot of people are also non-religious. This is the fastest growing sector in the United States are people who don't have any religious affiliation. And the idea is that you can have that freedom to choose what religion, what lifestyle you want in the United States. An ideal of equality is that you can marry whoever you want. So here you have two different kinds of weddings. You have Ed and Trina Edwards. Ed's 86, Trina's 34. But they can do that in this country. Here you have Kirion Richardson and Carl Halen. They are in a homosexual relationship. They are in a gay marriage now. They can do that in this country. Our political system is split between two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, and they offer different ideas of how to run the country. Um, so you have Donald Trump, who represents the Republicans, a conservative, conservative aspect. You have someone like Joe Biden, who is going to be the nominee for the Democratic president um, presidency. And so these are the liberal ideas. And the idea is that we get to choose between these. You get to choose whether you want to vote for a conservative or a liberal. The economic ideal in the United States is the idea of the free market. This is an economy of, by, and for the people. The idea is that individual makes their own decisions about how to earn and spend money. The idea is that the government keeps its hands off that. There are government regulations, but it is capitalist. It is free market. Um, People get incredibly rich in the United States, like you see Bill Gates. Remember, we learned about the robber barons, uh, Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, how incredibly rich they got. That is an ideal of the United States. We look at people, we voted for a president who was a businessman. He was a billionaire. Um, the, idea is the, the idea of free market, it's your money, spend it how you want, start businesses. And so a big part of capitalism is the idea of choice. It's your money, spend it how you want. We live in a world of advertisements, of options. The average grocery store carries 45,000 different items. There are 387 brands and types of cereal. That's one for each day 
of the year with some left over. There are tons and tons of options. It can be overwhelming almost. But the idea is that you can spend your money on anything you want for the most part. In America, we worship celebrities. We look up to people based on the idea of money. Like I said, we voted for Donald Trump for president on the idea that he is a billionaire. Um, you have someone like Kim Kardashian, who is from a reality show, but has built up a huge fortune based on that. She has a $149 million fortune. She lives in a two or a $20 million house, and her cars include a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes, Ferrari, Porsche, Lamborghini, Land Rover, and a Bentley. So this is kind of the American ideal. We look up to this person and be like, oh, look at all our money. Look at all our cars. You can have these things in America. You have people like Taylor Swift, who through her talent and through her musical abilities have amassed a great fortune. Taylor Swift is worth about $250 million. She's currently renting an apartment for $45,000 per month. She bought a $27 million apartment in New York City and a $17 million beach house in Rhode Island. That is, she can earn that money through her talent. She gets incredibly rich and she's able to buy things, the things she wants, such as large apartments, beach houses. So the big idea in the United States is the idea of the individual, the idea of people power. That is the most important thing in the U.S. People should be able to do what they want when they want to do it. As long as you're not harming other people, you're not breaking laws, go for it. Wear a bucket to a Denver Broncos game. Um, express yourself, be yourself, make money off yourself. That is the American ideal. So do what you want to do. Maybe if you're a young girl, you want to be a cheerleader or maybe you want to play football. You have those options. You can make your own choice. You're not born a certain way in life. You can have options. Do what you want to do in the United States. Let's take now take a minute to look at the Soviet values. The Soviet Union and the communist regime, which ran the Soviet Union, had very different ideas of what life was supposed to be like and what people were supposed to be like. The USSR emphasized control and stability. The Soviet Union was a totalitarian government. The government exercised total control over the people. You have someone like Joseph Stalin at the top who has complete control over the country. The people have no rights. It is what Stalin says, and that trickles down through the party. The party controls everything. Um, it is complete control of your life. For those who dared question this system the or question the Communist Party, the Soviet Union had what was known as the Gulag system. This is basically a prison camp system. Uh, the Soviet government needed free labor to work the land, so if you, if you were an enemy of the state, or if they deemed you an enemy of the state, if you did something wrong, they could send you to, most often to Siberia, which is in um, the far reaches of Russia, and they arrested innocent people and forced them into concentration camps. So they are forced to work for the government. So you have stories of people like Maria Chetbotaria, um, who took three pounds of rye from her former field which had been taken by the government to feed her four starving children. So the government came in, said, this is our farm now. It's no longer yours. Her children are starving. She goes back to the field, which she used to own, takes three pounds of rye from it, and is arrested for that. She is forced to labor in Siberia for 12 years in the gulag. Siberia is in the Arctic Circle, a lot of it. So she's forced in these freezing tundra, working for 12 years because she stole food from her former field to feed her children. She never saw her children again. As a result of this government control, as a result of the gulag system, millions of people are worked to death in the gulags. Um, so you see concentration camps where people are worked to death similar to what you see in Nazi Germany. While you don't have the mass executions that you do in the Holocaust, people are being worked to death. Farms are also being collected. People are being starved to death. The government has complete control and is killing people. One disaster that kind of symbolizes the nature of the Soviet Union but also would lead to other people realizing the cracks in the system and that would eventually bring down the Soviet Union was the accident at Chernobyl. This was the nuclear reactor melted down in 1986. The government refused to evacuate people from nearby towns and cities. They told residents that they were safe. So there's a nuclear reactor in Chernobyl, it melts down, releasing radiation all over the area. The government comes in and says, no, everything's fine. We've got it under control. You're safe, stay where you are. The result of this, were massive cancer rates and birth defects because of radiation poisoning. You can see here a picture of young children who are born with massive tumors on their head and on their back as a result of the radiation poisoning from the Chernobyl disaster. So the government come in, came in and basically told everyone, just stay, you're fine. 
Um, we've got under control. And obviously they did not. Here's more depictions of children born with birth defects as a result of being born or living in the area closer to Chernobyl in the disaster. Uh, and you can see just the effects of boy missing arm, another boy with elephantitis, the legs. Um, so just it shows the government incompetence and the way they could lie to you and can try to control your life, try to uh, mitigate disasters by lying to people, by thinking that they have things under control when they really don't. You can also see the treatment of people by the Soviet Union in Simi, Kazakhstan. In Simi, the Soviet Union tested 500 nuclear weapons. This led to severe radiation. Um, the people were exposed to this, but the government didn't care. Here you can see how someone has been deformed by that radiation. Uh, this man playing piano and obviously has growth on his face. Um, and so, but the Soviet Union, the government often would not care about stuff like this. They'd be like, we have to do these things. Sorry, you're in the way. You're just part of the machine. So another aspect is the communist economy. There is no free market. The government controls the economy. The government controls everything. So the government determined supply and demand. Leaders controlled what was produced, how much of it, and what it cost, etc. This led to little food, few choices, and long lines. People would have to wait for hours for a loaf of bread, wait in line for um, some corn, for some cereal, for something like that. You don't go to the store and pick out whatever you want. You wait in line and the government gives it to you. You get a paper cup of vodka for the week. You get your loaf of bread. You do not have the choice. The government supplies you shampoo. The government will supply you soap. Because of this government control, there's nothing to buy. People had to wait 10 to 15 years to get an apartment. You had to apply for an apartment through the government. Once it became available, the government will give you an apartment. The population was about the same size as the United States, but the economy was about 30% of America's throughout the Cold War. So you don't go shopping for clothes. The government gives it to you. You don't go shopping for watches. Government supplies that. TVs, you might be lucky enough to get one of those. Bicycles, windshield wipers, medicine, toilet paper. The government controls the production of all these things and gives it out to people. Since it took so long to get an apartment, people were often forced to live together. Here is a picture of a family sharing one apartment. You have 20, 30 people in an apartment. They can't afford anything else. They can't buy anything else because there's no money. There's no economy like that. There isn't a free market. The government just says, here's your apartment. Well, we got a lot of people. Make it work. The government also provides you with your jobs. You are assigned a job or you apply to a job with the government. The government sends you to work somewhere. And this is often very hard work and they don't pay you much at all. There aren't goods to buy, so they give you very little in reward for your work. You are basically working for the government. The government will give you stuff in reward for that. So in the Soviet Union, the most important thing is the government, is the Communist Party, which controls the government. The government is all encompassing. There's no state religion. There is no free market. There's no freedom of choice. You are a part of of the Soviet Union. You are a part of the government. The government controls what you do, controls your life. It is a totalitarian state. So immediately following World War II, the United States realizes that the nature of communism is that it is promoting a worldwide revolution, that it hopes to control governments throughout the world, overthrow capitalist governments, overthrow democracies. And a lot of this is laid out in an American diplomat's telegram back George Kennan sends a telegram, which is known as the Long Telegram, which says basically that communists are going to try to take over the world. And so what happens is based on this is the idea of the overall goal of the United States is to contain the spread of communists to other countries, keep it from going other places. So the Soviet Union controls a large block. They now control Eastern Europe after the war. But the idea is to stop the spread to other countries. So the policy of containment is established in what is known as the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine establishes the goal of containing the USSR. The US followed this policy throughout the Cold War. So you can see here in the depiction of Stalin overtaking from Russia, spreading out through Eastern Europe, putting Soviet flags all over Eastern Europe in the question mark over France. So the idea here is to stop the spread. The Truman Doctrine says not one inch further. So if we go back and look at the Marshall Plan, which was issued in 1948, remember this is the economic program to help rebuild Western Europe. Um, the idea is to try to prevent what happened in World War II, but it 
also part of this is to stop the spread of communism. It is to rebuild Western Europe into democracies, into capitalist democracies, and so they will be allies of the United States, and they will not fall into the grips of communism. The first real conflict of the Cold War occurs during the Berlin Airlift in 1948. So what happens is, remember, Berlin is divided between Soviet forces and American forces. The Soviet forces and the East German troops move in and cut off West Berlin, basically occupy Berlin. The U.S. resupplied West Berlin, and planes took off or landed every 30 seconds for over a year. They dropped 8,000 tons of goods per day. So the United States is basically dropping goods into Berlin to try to keep them from falling into communism. Um, and this is the first time that the United States and the Soviet Union are almost directly in conflict. They're not fighting directly, but the United States is fighting against the Soviet advancement. In 1949, alliances are made between countries that support the United States and countries that support the Soviet Union. So the United States and the USSR create alliances as tensions and hostilities increase. So by 1949, it's apparent that these two could be going to war. Um, so the United States and the Western European allies form what is known as NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO is still in operation today. The idea behind NATO is that it will be a collective force to face what is the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact is a um, is an alliance amongst those countries under Soviet control. So the countries of Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Hungary, um, Romania, Ukraine, all of these countries that Russia and the Soviet Union control. So you end up with NATO versus Warsaw. So you can see here a depiction of that. You can see the blue countries are NATO states. The United States is also a NATO member. Um, and then you can see the Warsaw Pact states in red. So you have Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania. So you can see how Europe is divided down the middle um, between countries between powers that would most likely go to war. Also in 1949, there's another large blow to the idea of containment and the fear that the United States has the spread of communism. Um, China, the Chinese nationalist government is overthrown in 1949 by Mao Zedong's communists shortly after World War II. Um, and this is the growth of communists Communism now severely threatens the United States. So it isn't just the Soviet Union, East Europe. Now it's China, that huge country, uh, as a communist state now. So the United States sees this idea of containment failing. You can see that here in the map. Communism covered much of the world. So you have from Eastern Europe all the way through China. Um, this is at its height in the 1960s. But this is really the fear is that this is going to continue to spread, that communism is a worldwide revolution to overthrow these capitalist governments and that it's spreading. So the United States has to do something about that. A huge aspect of the Cold War is the threat of nuclear war. Nuclear war is scary. Nuclear war keeps the countries from going to war because they have the power to destroy each other. But a nuclear arms race significantly heightened the tension between the United States and the USSR. A single mistake or angry decision could completely destroy both countries. So they cannot mess around with diplomacy the way they had before, with conflict the way. Nuclear war changes the nature of this conflict. And the Cold War really changes when the Soviet Union detonates an atomic device in 1949. So they're the second country, the second power to become a nuclear power. And so for four years, the United States is the only country that has atomic weapons. Um, now the Soviet Union has them, and they're in conflict with each other. They have ideological conflict. They have conflict throughout the world. It just really changes the nature. And the Soviets begin to terrify the Americans. The idea that the Soviet Union can now destroy the United States with nuclear weapons. But the Soviets also launch Sputnik in 1957. This is the first satellite um, they launch a device into the atmosphere, into orbit. So the idea is like the Soviets are ahead of the United States. They can launch satellites. What kind of nuclear weapons, what kind of devices can they attack us with? So the United States is in a state of fear throughout the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s. The idea is that World War III could happen at any time. You see that here in the depiction that a nuclear attack could happen on Washington, D.C. You have preparations 
you have children here prepping for a nuclear attack by hiding under their desks. Um, the idea is that war is imminent. The Cold War could become deadly and hot at any moment. So during the 1950s, President Eisenhower issued the policy of massive retaliation to threaten the USSR. So the USSR has, has nuclear weapons now. And so what Eisenhower says that if you dare attack the United States, if you dare do anything, whether it's nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, we will launch a massive retaliation strike on you. We will annihilate you with nuclear weapons. So what all this leads to is an arms race, a nuclear arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States. The U.S. conducted over a thousand nuclear tests during the Cold War and amassed a stockpile of over 30,000 nuclear warheads by the 1960s. The idea is that they do not want to let the Soviet Union get ahead in nuclear production, so they keep producing nuclear weapons. Both sides are building up an insane amount of nuclear weapons, and both sides are keeping the world in fear of nuclear war, of World War III, and annihilation. We'll look at more of that moving forward.